In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. So says St Paul in his letter to the Church of Galatia, and I wanted to use the opportunity of having St Paul speak to us to give a brief tribute to the Apostle. And it was one of the things that I wanted to do while we were in Damascus recently to uh, take the team to see the uh, home of Judas in Straight Street, the place where Ananias prayed for St Paul, formerly Saul, persecutor of the church, and baptised him. Um, I've ended up at the uh, chapel there just about every time I've been to Damascus. Uh, it's right in the middle of the old city. You have to climb down a set of stairs uh, to get to it once the small house now converted into a chapel. Though interestingly, it was apparently once at street level. Uh, over the years, the newer buildings have been built on top of the old, such that the modern buildings are now uh, one level higher up than those that existed in New Testament times. And uh, it's a little chapel with, with the Eucharistic table at the front, and behind that table there's a distinctive carving uh, featuring three of the key moments Paul had in Damascus. Uh, Paul falling off his horse on the road into the city where he struck blind, uh, Paul being baptised by Ananias, and Paul being lowered over the wall of Damascus in a basket after plots on his life forced him to make a hasty exit from the city. I mean, of course, these stories are all detailed in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, where I assume we've read about them. Uh, I found, though, that a number of our boxes for, tea, boxes for peace team hadn't read about them, and I was keen to, for them to see the site and learn something in this piece of history. So after an extensive uh, stint in Damascus's most famous ice creamery, uh, I asked our guide, uh, take us to the chapel of St. Ananias, and uh, I was convinced it was only a short walk from where we were. Go to the street named Straight, I barked out. And uh, our guide seemed to know exactly what I was talking about, but after walking for about 40 minutes, with me thinking the chapel was just around every next corner, I realised there'd been a mix-up, and sure enough, when I was told, here we are at this lovely Orthodox church building, uh, we had to reorientate ourselves back to the uh, original location, which was a lot closer to where we started from than where we were. And by the time we got there, the house was closed to the public, uh, which was painful. Not only because I'd, uh, well, not really because I'd expected any of our team to have their own Damascus experience at the uh, Damascus Road experience, rather, at the house, but simply because I really. Uh, feel that that place is one of Christianity's most significant historic sites. Uh, indeed, it could be said that Christianity as a religion started in that house. Now, I appreciate that's a provocative statement, and I don't mean to, to uh, deny for a second that the Christian faith, as we experience it, is deeply rooted in the person of Jesus. Uh, even so, the communal dimension of our faith in all its multi-ethnic, multi-racial and multi-coloured complexity really begins with the church building work of the Apostle Paul and Paul the Apostle begins in that house in Damascus. Uh, Paul was a fighter. That's one of the things I love about the man. Indeed, whenever you come across him in the New Testament, Paul is almost always fighting with someone or is in some sort of desperate trouble. And the, uh, the carving I mentioned in that chapel in Damascus uh, is archetypal in that regard. Paul falling off his horse, Paul groping blindly while Ananias prays for him, Paul hiding in a basket, fleeing for his life. <coughs> Paul managed to get himself into trouble just about everywhere he went, getting everybody offside at one time or another. I mean, he remained a proud Jew throughout his life, though it was the leaders of the Jewish community that he was fleeing from when he escaped Damascus, uh, from where they continued to pursue him, of course. 
he was a leader in the Christian community, though he always seemed to be at odds with others in leadership positions, including some of the apostles and most definitely the apostle Peter. He was a Roman citizen, but it was the Romans who killed him eventually, of course. He was a man who never seemed to know any real peace in his life, beyond that mysterious peace that he spoke of that passes all human understanding. And the issue for Paul was always the same. He believed in a church that was bigger than Judaism, where it didn't matter if you're Jewish or Greek or Indigenous Australian or anything else. All were equal. All were loved. And, and it was that uh, vision, well, it was a vision, I think, that ultimately none of his peers really ultimately got on board with. Of course, we, we take the equality that the erases for granted. Um, it's it's self-evident to us now. How could it be otherwise? Uh, as I've said before, truth seems to evolve in three stages. First, it seemed to be ridiculous, then it's violently opposed, and finally, it's accepted as being self-evident. We're privileged to have been born into a generation where the truth of the equality of all races is indeed seen to be self-evident. But Paul was always either, either ridiculed or violently opposed, and in his case, uh, we're not speaking metaphorically when we speak of violently. I mean, one question that always comes to mind when I think about St. Paul and one question I've contemplated as I sat in the chapel of St. Ananias is what made Paul think he was right? I mean, Paul took on everybody from Jews to Romans to his fellow Christians from the Apostle Peter on down brandishing his own peculiar understanding of the mission of Jesus to the world, maintaining that it was simply no longer relevant whether you were Jewish or Greek or male or female or rich or poor or weak or powerful or smart or simple. It was all the same to God. What made Paul so sure he was right? Behind the polemic we read in the letter that the Church of Galatia is exactly that question, of course. What makes you think you're right, Paul? authoritative looking brothers and sisters have come up here from the church in Jerusalem telling us that you've got it wrong. Telling us that we do need to embrace some of the Jewish elements of our faith such as circumcision if we're to be fully in sync with God. Why shouldn't we listen to them? And what's Paul's response? Even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, now I say to you again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than you accepted, let them be under God's curse. I mean, that's Paul at his uncompromising best. And those who are familiar with the history of ecclesiastical debate will appreciate why the... Uh, with, ecclesiastical debate within the Western Church at least, will appreciate why polemical Protestants have regularly taken Paul to be their champion. I mean, I was brought up in a household where we weren't explicitly told that all Catholics were going to hell, but where you knew that if you were uh, crossing yourself and saying the rosary, uh, you were playing with fire. Why? Because Catholics didn't believe in the Bible. They believed in the traditions and teachings of popes and prelates. And their faith, their faith was in this corrupt institution rather than in Christ and in the Bible. And they gleaned truth from, the, from their traditions rather from the, the clear waters of scripture. Now, in St. Paul, you know, here he seems to, to champion that Protestant cause completely. If, if I, we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. It doesn't matter what the Pope says, it doesn't matter what I say. It wouldn't matter if an angel from heaven said it to you. If it's garbage, it's garbage. Don't believe it. As I say, it's obvious enough why those who are critical of the churches and the ecclesiastical institution see St. Paul as their champion. But he clearly did not believe the ecclesiastical pedigree of the speaker guaranteed the integrity of the message. 
Even so, Paul, Paul isn't an archetypal Protestant either, sort of pointing us instead to the clear word of Scripture, not in this instance. At any rate, in this section of the letter to the Galatians, Paul simply appeals to the spiritual insights of the people, or so it seems, as if they should know instinctively that what he's saying is true. And well, we have no idea, of course, how Paul's letter was ultimately received uh, by these people. I envisage any number of people in the Church of Galatia must have felt quite ambivalent about it all. Why, why should we believe you, Paul? And why should we assume that you have a monopoly on the truth? What makes you think you're always right? I mean, shouldn't we at least listen to these people from Jerusalem and, and hear what they have to say? I mean, after all, they are the direct lead back to Jesus, whom you never actually met except in that strange experience you keep telling us about, the one that you had on the road to Damascus. And, and that, was, that was the heart of the issue for St Paul, I believe. Paul wasn't a good Catholic in a sense. He was preaching just a repetition of what he'd been taught by others more senior in the faith. He wasn't acting as an emissary from Peter, James or the other apostles. Uh, and so I say he wasn't a good that Catholic, but he wasn't a good Protestant either, in that he didn't come to faith in Christ through the reading of the Scriptures. I mean, not at all. Paul had not sort of stood up after a 40-day period of fasting and contemplation of the Torah to say, my God, I have it all up wrong. Jesus is the Messiah after all. I see it clearly now. That wasn't how it happened. We know full well how it happened. He fell off his horse. Jesus confronted him directly on the road to Damascus. I mean, that was Paul's story at any rate, and it was certainly at the core of Paul's self-understanding. He was a man who'd switched tracks mid-career on the basis of a confrontation he had with the Almighty that he simply couldn't get past. And that's one of the extraordinary things, I think, about St Paul as a human being, is that he was able to dismiss an entire lifetime of learning, steeped in the traditions of his forefathers, all on the basis of one extraordinary experience. They say that after the death of uh, Blaise Pascal, the, the great philosopher, that they found sewn into the lining of his jacket an account he wrote of his life-changing encounter with God, uh, the experience he had. He always kept the account with him. Uh, I won't read it all as it's quite long, but it begins, Year of Grace, 1654, Monday, 23rd of November, Feast of St. Clement, Pope and Martyr, and of the others in Martyrology, Eve of St. Chrysogenus, Martyr and others, from about half past 10 in the evening until half past midnight, fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars. Certainty, certainty, heartfelt joy, peace. Pascal, as I say, kept his handwritten account of this intense experience of God next to his heart, literally, till the day he died. And I suspect that when he struggled with doubts or uncertainties or wasn't sure of the way forward, he probably put his hand on his heart over where he stored that piece of paper and so reminded himself of his experience, an experience that, that strengthened him and gave him the resolve he needed when he needed it. And, and Paul was exactly like that, I think. I don't know if he kept an account of his Damascus Road experience sewn into his clothing, but he evidently talked about it all the time. The story turns up three times on Paul's lips in the book of Acts, and repeated references are made to it in his letters, reflecting, I assume, the regularity with which he shared his story. I mean, if Paul had lived to his dotage and ended up in a retirement home, 
I envisage him as one of those cantankerous old souls who would have come out at least once a day with, did I ever tell you about the time I was on the road to Damascus? To which everybody would say, only about 5,000 times, thank you, Grandpa. It was the experience that defined Paul's life. And this might make him sound like someone more at the sort of extreme Pentecostal end of the Christian spectrum rather than a Protestant or a Catholic, but you can't really pigeonhole him there either because he never seemed to expect uh, anybody else to have those sorts of bizarre experiences. He seemed to think that his experience with Christ was as unique as it was transformative. So unfortunately neither Ange nor myself nor our team got to visit the chapel of St Ananias in Damascus, though I, I was concerned at the time that, that the experience, if, if we had had it, might have been a bit of an anticlimax anyway. Um, I say that because I've been talking the place up a fair bit and uh, I was also conscious I was talking to a group that had just recently visited the, the grand tomb of Hafez al-Assad, the shrine of Zainab and, and of course the ruins of Palmyra and in each case the word majestic uh, comes to mind. Uh, these were each spectacular landmarks of architectural excellence and spiritual beauty. Uh, the chapel of Ananias on the other hand is just another house in Straight Street so inconspicuous it takes you forever to find it. Perhaps, as I say, finding the house earlier would have been something of an anticlimax on account of its relative ordinariness. But I have a feeling that's exactly how St Paul uh, would have liked it. A monument to the great founder of the modern church that remains a very simple place of prayer for Paul. For all his greatness, was, was not an arrogant man. For all his stridents, was not an arrogant man. He was a humble man, a lonely man, a damaged man, a fighter. He was a man who one day on the road to Damascus experienced Jesus, an experience that transformed, energised and animated him the rest of his life. May God give us grace to tap into that same transformative energy that is Christ.